Hello, I'm Dr. Kathleen Olive, and welcome to Limelight Arts Travel's art podcast, A Closer Look. Siena in the 14th century was a powerhouse of Western Europe, a banking and trading giant, one of Italy's most popular cities, and a byword for wealth, luxury, sophistication, and elegance. Its museums and galleries in their art and architecture made before the devastating Black Death of 1348 still preserve some of the most important examples of the Gothic style in all of Italy. Other key works instead have made their way to the collections of other cities. In this episode, I'm joined by art historian and specialist guide Freya Middleton. Freya introduces us to a superlative work of the Sienese Gothic, the Annunciation completed by Simone Martini and his brother-in-law Lippo Memmi. Today, it's preserved in Florence's Uffizi Gallery. Well, welcome Freya Middleton to A Closer Look and which work have you chosen for us to talk about today? The Spectacular Annunciation by Simone by Simone Martini from the year 1333. I'm so pleased that you chose this painting, Freya, because, and I'm, I'm sure you encounter this every day in your work as a specialist art history guide in Florence, but each time I've been to the Uffizi with groups of people, this is a painting that stops people in their tracks. So can you uh, describe for those people who are listening and might not have had the pleasure of standing in front of this artwork, can you please describe it for us? Absolutely. So it would be described as a uh, polyptych. So therefore, let's immediately remind everyone that it's the, the year is 1333. And so this means the Gothic period. So do imagine, therefore, it was an altarpiece for a ch chapel inside the Cathedral of Siena. And remember that in 1333, we are talking about the Republic of Siena, so the country of Siena. And it is wealthy. It's a very wealthy merchant uh, country where everyone merchant uh, republic and uh, their magnificent cathedral remember that you know it's the kind of space race in the medieval and the renaissance period of who's got the most beautifully decorated and the largest cathedral etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the cnes are absolutely intent on having a spectacularly beautiful cathedral both architecturally, you know, artistically decorated inside and out. And so this extraordinary polyptic, which means therefore um, a altarpiece that is divided up into separate areas. So it's got individual, let's say, almost niches, if you will, on the flat surface. And the frame outlines, therefore, these different areas. And um, it was for this chapel dedicated to one of the uh, patron saints of the city. And this chapel was dedicated to Saint Ansano, one of the four patron saints of the city. And so this, unfortunately, this polyptic now uh, is found in um, the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, where really it would be quite spectacular. Of course, but we can say that about every piece of art really to be seen in situ where it was actually destined, you know, to be seen. Um, but do imagine what is so amazing, what stops people in, it, stop, it was so well said, Kathleen, because this really does stop people in tracks for many reasons. Now, first, I'd just like to say maybe the most obvious is that it's incredibly, uh, incredibly decorated with gold. It really would have been, it's spectacular inside the Uffizi Gallery, it would have knocked everyone's socks off uh, when seen inside the dark cathedral surrounded by candles. So unbelievably lavishly done with the use of gold. So a very gold background. But the central, uh, the theme of this uh, polyptic is the Annunciation. And so you have to imagine everybody that you have the Madonna on the right, in the central part of the polyptic, you have the Madonna, and she is just being, uh, and, you've, and the Archangel Gabriel has just arrived uh, to ask her, to announce to her, to see if she's going to accept uh, being the mother of God. And so this is the central theme. And then this, uh, this um, scene is flanked on either side 
by a saint. And the saint on the left-hand side is Saint Anselmo, one of those four uh, protective saints of Siena that I just mentioned to whom this chapel is dedicated. And he is holding a uh, flag, the flag of Siena, um, the flag of Siena is called the Balzana, which is half white and half black. And on the right-hand side, so to the right of the Virgin Mary, we have a woman, and uh, we're not entirely sure exactly who this is. It could be Santa Massima, and all the Italian books say this, who was indeed the mum of Santa Anzano, or it could be Santa Giuditta, which is actually written below on the frame, but the frame is a frame from the 19th century. So uh, we're not sure if it is Santa Giuditta or otherwise, you know, it could be Saint Margaret as well, Santa Margherita, not sure. Anyway, um, above these, this polyptych has five different uh, cusps. And so above the arches, the five arches of the polyptic, you have these small roundels and with uh, four of the five are of prophets. We know you can recognise that they are, they are prophets uh, because they're holding scrolls and uh, what is written on the scrolls identifies each of the prophets. Uh, and indeed you have you know, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel's recognised uh, as being beardless as always. And um, this is wonderful as a wonderful reminder of how much information you can glean from um, from a polyptic, from a from an altarpiece painting, because these prophets are present um, to remind us that they, in the Christian Bible, being made up of the Old and the New Testament, that they therefore foreshadow all the events in the New Testament. So you've got these these prophets above holding their scrolls, foreshadowing in, therefore, this new event of the coming of the King of Kings, the Messiah, uh, with the birth of. Um, the future birth of Christ. And uh, Simone Martini really, I mean, in the 1330s, he is the superstar artist of Siena. Um, he is extremely well known. He's international. He um, painted, was called to paint in the papal court of Avignon. Uh, he'll die in the following decade, about 10 years later. And so he's really, when he's commissioned by the uh, Committee of Works of the maintenance of the cathedral, the opera, the opera del Duomo of Siena, to do this most extraordinarily important work for the interior of their cathedral. He's at the height of his career and he produces, I would probably say, more than what they expected because not only is this, is this such a sumptuously, beautifully rendered uh, altarpiece, it's also very innovative as well. And what I think stops people in, in their tracks when they first see this is the way in which he depicts the Virgin Mary and the interaction, the, the communication, the connection between Gabriel and the Virgin Mary. Um, the, the Gabriel has just landed. Uh, you have to imagine that the rendering of Gabriel is fantastic because he's got his wings, of course, he's an archangel and he flies around. He's sent by God to, you know, uh, he's the messenger of the archangels and he's literally just landed. How do I know that? Because his mantle is fluttering, still fluttering out behind, behind him. And so you can literally see it hasn't even had the moment to settle on his back again. And let's also point out that this mantle is beautifully rendered tartan, which really underlines the absolute metropolis that Siena was. It was the last major place that people would walk through on the Via Francigena before hitting Rome. It was an unbelievably important banking money exchange area. And um, they had such traffic going through there, not only for the pilgrims, but of course, merchant traffic. And so the, um, the, the, the wilderness of, of Siena can be seen by this representation of this northern European um, cloth. And by the way, look at the render. The, when, when you look at an image of this, you'll see the rendering of this tartan. Um, actually, the way in which he's depicted it really follows the folds of the fabric as it would be when it's fluttering. It kind of is, is, is shown in a curvilinear way um, to represent a certain sense of realism in this wonderfully almost two-dimensional painting with this flat, fabulous gold background. Here we have this first 
of numerous instances of this rendering of realism in the painting that really makes it more immediate with this with the image. Now, I love also um, speaking of the the preciosity of the fabric that Sienna is so known for, uh, with this love of luxury. Um, the very fabric of 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 Gabriel, he's got this beyond the tartan mantle. He's wearing these robes that are it is beautiful celestial blue and gold and the way in which he renders the very fabric is done with this graffito technique he actually um layers the gold on the figure where he wants to you know show this fabric and then paints over it and then he'll peel away some of the paint to show the, the gold from underneath so again it's this wonderful textural ability to show this fabric that renders it so much more you know are luxurious and precious and it's in in its in its very being and then let's go to the face of the angel he's pressing forward he's got an unbelievably important message to give and 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 um you have to imagine uh, that he's he's actually kind of extending his neck reaching forward to get closer to the Virgin Mary. And the words are coming out of him, the very first part, saying, you know, hail Mary, uh, um, hail full of grace, the Lord is with thee, is what he's saying. The first part of his question to her is if she's going to accept, therefore, um, this unbelievably important mission to be the mother of God. And the words of the first part of what he's come down to say to her are actually written in the central focal point of the, of the altarpiece um, on the gold background. So in the centre part of this altarpiece, you don't have a figure you've actually got the words written in pastillas, so elevated. Simone Martini has actually moulded them out in plaster and with the gold gilding above, so they're elevated. I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic. So these, it's like a comic book as well. They've left his mouth and the virgin is recoiling. So looking at her, she's not your Fra Angelico 100 years later who is absolutely completely shown in the acceptance of this unbelievable mission. She's just still reeling from the fact that an angel has flown through her window and an alien from space, and she's recoiling. So looking at the way in which he shows the body of uh, the Virgin Mary, he's done it entirely with line, completely non jottoesque not of Giotto that's happening in another country nearby, Florence, where Giotto is all about the volume of the body, the heavy weight, the naturalism and the very presence of the body. He shows the Virgin Mary completely with line, this curvy linear line, but manages to show it, it which renders it in such a wonderfully courtly, elegant aspect. But the her legs are facing towards the, 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 the angel, but her bust is twisted the other way and her head is looking back and she's wrapping her mantle around her, bringing it as closely up to her face as possible because this thing has just flown through her window. So here we have the Virgin Mary being completely shocked with what's going on and not necessarily receiving it as you would. She was reading and she is holding her book, but she's closed her book and her thumb is holding, is, is acting as the bookmark. This, this small detail speaks volumes it renders the scene with this flat background showing you know the, the light of heaven in its earthly um it's like turning on a light bulb of its earthly immediacy turning on a light bulb Freya I think is a lovely way to describe this work because light is obviously so crucial to it gold as a medium it's so hard to see when you look at this as a flat reproduction uh the tooling on the halos for example how each figure has a different halo to the person next to them you've described the sgraffito technique on the angel's robe and the the raised up pastilla of the words i'm always particularly struck by the diaphanous cloud of cherubs in the sky who bear the dove whose uh, kind of inspiration of Mary, illumination of Mary is already proceeding down towards her for the conception of Christ. This to me is such a key Sienese work of art. And I wonder if by way of conclusion, you can say something for us about why such an iconic Sienese work of art 
is displayed in the Uffizi in Florence and how you would celebrate, I suppose, the contribution of Sienese art to Italian art history when so much of what we talk about in great Italian art has to do with its great neighbour and rival Florence instead. Um, unfortunately for the Sienese, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Ferdinando III, fell madly in love with it and so um, offered in exchange, absolutely, to Luca Giordano, so 17th century uh, paintings, which they have in the Museum of the Opera del Duomo uh, in, in Siena. And um, so really, obviously, they couldn't refuse him. Uh, and whilst Luca Giordano is a fabulous Baroque painter, losing this gem is something I think that they will never digest. And uh, so, but also, unfortunately, um, it had been it had lost its frame, uh, and so um, the um, the frame is not original. Um, but indeed, it does render, in any case, the, the very Gothic nature of of the painting. And what Siena, being having this unbelievable traffic, really from on the Via Francigena, uh, pilgrim and merchant route that ran straight through it. Uh, really getting so much traffic from the 11th century onwards, they were open to all the new the new innovation from the Gothic world of France. And with this love, indeed, of, um, of preciosity. And so it really is, Siena really is the most Gothic city in art and architecture that we have in Italy. And they really embraced, obviously, this this, these new novel ideas that they're getting their first hands to, which, of course, you know, Florence went in a completely different direction. First of all, the Via Francigena didn't go through Florence, but also in any case they have with Giotto um, at, from the Velio 1300s, who's embracing the exact opposite, the very grounding and very volumetric uh, consideration to the, uh, um, therefore, to and, and disregarding that sense of the element of the decoration and the CNEs with their love of decoration, the tooling, as you mentioned, and their love of gems and beauty and, um, and, and luxury. So Simone Martini really epitomizes this, but it's not to be viewed as just with the sense of that he's not an intent on the on the sense of great sense of emotional capacity and expressivity that was we said with the with the Virgin Mary and the angels is fantastic. And I love how you you mentioned the, the Holy Spirit above, but also the rest of his message is written beautifully in gold in the border of his robes and also in case he forgot his name he's also got his name written <laughs> on his cuff as well Gabriel which I think is just such a fun little you know almost humorous as well uh, addition he did this it, it is interesting to be reminded that he actually did this alongside we, we often we talk about Simone Martini and these great painters um, alone in this kind of vacuum and abyss. And, of course, they worked in workshops and he did this in collaboration with his brother-in-law, uh, Lippo Memmi, and, indeed, that is written at the bottom of the frame, um, precisely stating that this work was done in 1333 by Simone Martini and Lippo Memmi. It's not understood exactly what Lippo Memmi did and Simone Martini by their, their individual personal hands. It's assumed that uh, possibly Simone Martini did that central work, which, by the way, um, and Lippo Memmi did the flanking saint possibly however it is interesting as well my last thing to say about this uh, it's an, it's so innovative as well it's really the first polyptic that one can see that has the unified space with the three central areas of the polyptic you know and what's again what's interesting is that the central part actual central focus of this um altarpiece is the beautifully rendered vase with lilies that most um the most commonly used symbol of the virgin mary Freya Middleton, thank you so much for outlining for us some of the achievements of this most elegant Gothic masterpiece from balance and humanity and gesture and a love of luxury uh, and, a, and a complex theology as well. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you, Kathleen. You've been listening to Limelight Arts Travels podcast, A Closer Look. It was recorded on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders past and present.